Welcome to the tutorial for book three, chapter 13, um, called 52. So this video is going to, I'll read with you, but I will also be instructing. So this is not just listening to the audio of A Tale of Two Cities, it's also instructional. On your OneNote page, you have um, the plot summary is already completed for you. Your job is to complete the character list and the motifs. I also want you to be thinking about what um, the little seamstress means when we are introduced to that new character. So let us begin. In the black prison of the conciergerie, the doomed of the day awaited their fate. They were in number as the weeks of the year. Fifty-two were to roll that afternoon on the life tide of the city to the boundless, everlasting sea. Before their cells were quit of them, new occupants were appointed. Before their blood ran into the blood spilled yesterday, the blood that was to mingle with theirs tomorrow was already set apart. Two score and twelve were told off. From the farmer general of seventy, whose riches could not buy his life, to the seamstress of twenty, whose poverty and obscurity could not save her. Those two characters are important to be mentioned because by the time the Reign of Terror was in full swing, most of the people executed at the guillotine were not aristocrats. In fact, the guillotine began to serve as a means of retribution for people, or if you wanted someone's apartment, have them executed, the apartment was yours. So it became this really um, terrifying instrument uh, that people could use on a whim. So most of the people executed during the Reign of Terror really weren't um, people that the revolution intended to um, usurp politically. Physical diseases engendered in the vices and neglects of men will seize on victims of all degrees, and the frightful moral disorder born of unspeakable suffering, intolerable oppression, and heartless indifference smote equally without distinction. In other words, it doesn't matter if you're an aristocrat or impoverished. If you're a jerk, you're a jerk. Charles Darnay, alone in a cell, had sustained himself with no flattering delusion since he came to it from the tribunal. In every line of the narrative he had heard, he had heard his condemnation. He had fully comprehended that no personal influence could possibly save him that he was virtually sentenced by the millions, and that units could avail him of nothing. Nevertheless, it was not easy with the face of his beloved wife fresh before him to compose his mind to what it must bear. His hold on life was strong, and it was very, very hard to loosen. By gradual efforts and degrees unclosed a little here, it clenched the tighter there, and when he brought his strength to bear on that hand, and it yielded, this was closed again. There was no hurry, too, in all his thoughts, a turbulent and heated working of his heart that contended against resignation. If for a moment he did feel resigned, then his wife and child, who had to live after him, seemed to protest and to make a selfish thing. But all this was at first. Before long, the consideration that there was no disgrace in the fate he must meet, and that numbers went to the same road wrong, wrongfully and trod it firmly every day, sprang up to stimulate them. Next followed the thought that much of the future peace of mind enjoyable by the dear ones depended on his quiet fortitude. So, by degrees, he calmed into the better state when he could raise his thoughts much higher and draw comfort down. Before it, set, before it set in dark on the night of his condemnation, he had traveled thus far on his last way. Being allowed to purchase the means of riding and a light, he sat down to write until such time as the prison lamps should be extinguished. He wrote a long letter to Lucy, showing her that he had known nothing of her father's imprisonment until he had heard of it from herself and that he had been as ignorant as she of his father's and his uncle's responsibility for that misery until the paper had been read. He had already explained to her that this, his concealment from herself of the name he had relinquished, 
was the one condition, fully intelligible now, that her father had attached to their betrothal, and was the one promise he had still exacted on the morning of their marriage. He entreated her for her father's sake, never to seek to know whether her father had become oblivious of the existence of the paper, or had had it recalled to him for the moment or for good by the story of the tower, the D.I.G., the dig story, on that old Sunday under the dear old clean tree in the garden. If he had preserved any definite remembrance of it, there could be no doubt that he had supposed it destroyed with the steel when he had found no mention of it among the relics of the prisoners which the populace discovered there, and which had been described to all the world. He besought her, though he added that he knew it was needless, to console her father by impressing him through every tender means she could think of, with the truth that he had done nothing for which he could justly reproach himself, but had uniform, un, excuse me, but had uniformly forgotten himself for their joint sakes. Next, to her preservation of his own last grateful love and blessing, and her overcoming of her sorrow to devote herself to their dear child, he adjured her, as they would meet in heaven, to comfort her father. To her father himself, he wrote in the same strain, but he told her father that he expressly confided his wife and child to his care, and he told him this very strongly with the hope of rousing him from any despondency or dangerous retrospect towards which he foresaw he might be tending. To Mr. Lorry, he commended them all and explained his worldly affairs. That done, with many added sentences of grateful friendship and warm attachment, all was done. He never thought of pardon. His mind was so full of the others that he never once thought of them. He had time to finish these letters before the lights were put out. When he lay down on his straw bed, he thought that he had done with this world. But it beckoned him back in his sleep and showed itself in shining forms, free and happy, back in the old house in Soho, though it had nothing in it like the real house. Unaccountably released, and light of heart, he was with Lucy again, and she told him it was all a dream, and he had never gone away, a pause of forgetfulness, and then he had even suffered, and had come back to her, dead and at peace. And yet, there was no difference in him. Another pause of oblivion, and he awoke in the somber morning, unconscious, where he was or what had happened, until it flashed upon his mind. This is the day of my death. Thus he had come through the hours to the day when the fifty-two heads were to fall. Now, while he was composed and hoped that he could meet the end with quiet heroism, a new action began in his waking thoughts, which was very difficult to master. He had never seen the instrument that was to terminate his life. How high it was from the ground, how many steps it had, where he would be stood, how he would be touched, whether the touching hands would be dyed red, which way his face would be turned, whether he would be the first or might be the last. These and many similar questions, in no wise directed by his will, obtruded themselves over and over again countless times. Or were they connected with fear, he was conscious of no fear. Rather, they originated in a strange, besetting desire to know what to do when the time came. A desire gigantically disproportionate to the few swift moments to which it referred. A wondering that was more like the wondering of some other spirit within his than his own. The hours went on as he walked to and fro, and the clocks struck the numbers he would never see again. Nine, gone forever. Ten, gone forever. Eleven, gone forever. Twelve, coming on to pass away. After a hard contest with the eccentric action of thought, which at last perplexed him, he had got the better of it. He walked up and down, softly repeating the names to himself. The worst of the strife was over. He could walk up and down, free from distracting fancies, praying for himself and for them. Twelve had gone 
Also, when they again for part two.